foreseeable future, the most direct threat to America at home and abroad remains terrorism. But a strategy that involves invading every country that harbors terrorist networks is naive and unsustainable. I believe we must shift our counterterrorism strategy, drawing on the successes and shortcomings of our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan to more effectively partner with countries where terrorist networks seek a foothold. All right. I, I, welcome back, folks. Uh, glad to be back. Uh, that's the president at West Point today giving an address, foreign policy address, uh, touting his foreign policy accomplishments, talking about foreign policy going forward. Again, I know it's a foreign policy address, but why you would feel the need to get so specific um, and say, you know, just because there are terrorist groups in certain countries, we're not going to go there. Uh, here's what we're going to do instead. I, I, I just don't, I, I would just like to say that the war on terror will continue and we will find these terrorists wherever they are and kill them. That would be the best thing to say and then shut up about what you mean and how you're going to do it and who's going to help and what the MO is. Just leave the terrorists to think that you will invade them. You will be coming. But he just basically told them, hey, you got safe haven if you're in most countries because we're tired of doing that. Uh, we'll talk about that later on uh, on the panel. Um, also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have um, the uh, Mexican, the, the Marine who's being held in Mexico in a prison who's been chained to his bed because he made a, a, a wrong turn and a, a poorly lit uh, border crossing by San Diego and uh, wound up in Mexico with three registered guns. Bottom line, he's in court today. The media is barred from that court proceeding. Uh, he is there with his mom, or he had a chance to speak to his mom, I should say, before the court proceeding. And let's hope that this ends and he gets out of there. And let's hope the U.S. government goes to bat for him. Now, something else the U.S. government has to do is explain uh, how they outed the CIA bureau chief in Afghanistan, in, in Kabul. Uh, when the president went there on Memorial Day, inadvertently they put the, the, the head of the CIA outpost there uh, on a list. They made it public. Uh, his life's now in danger. The life of his family's now in danger. And the White House, don't worry, Obama's going to get to the bottom of it. The White House will investigate how the White House did this. So you know that's going to be taken care of and everything is going to be just fine. So what can I tell you? All right, we're joined right now, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, by my friend, the president of the Catholic League, the one and only Bill Donahue. How you doing, Steve? Always great to see you, sir. All right, so uh, before we get to the, uh, the, the, uh, the Pope's visit in the Middle East and some of the uh, intricacies of it, um, the Pope, and, and sometimes the media misinterprets what the Pope says and puts too much on it, but I want to get your opinion on this, um, that the door is always open to rethink celibacy when it comes to priests. Uh, is this shocking? Is this unexpected? Is this something consistent with what he said before, or is this, uh, this a really big deal? Well, when, when Cardinal Egan left as the Archbishop of New York, one of the last things he said is maybe the time has come to rethink it. Look, the first thousand years of church history, celibacy was expected, but it wasn't required. In, this, in the second thousand years, they made it mandated. It's what we call a discipline. In other words, it's a man-made kind of rule. It has nothing to do with dogma. It's not I like the, the Jesus and the resurrection and Easter. So they could change this if they wanted. Just they changed meat on Friday. Will they change it? I don't know. What is striking to me, though, is this. He has three days, historic trip, trying to deal with Christians and Muslims and Jews and bring about peace. He feels 11 questions on the way back on the plane, nine of which uh, are, are on different areas. But he ch the one that's the most interesting is about sexuality. I mean, I, I actually think at some point, if Pope Francis or any pope were to stave off World War III, coming back on the plane, they would ask him about sex. Yeah. I, I've never seen such an obsession about it. They don't care about Muslims and Jews. They don't care about Jerusalem. They care about nothing but sex. And this is the media's obsession. They say Catholics are obsessed about sex. No, it's the secular media. Right. And, 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 and what gets me is it's, it's usually that question on celibacy. It's women in the priesthood. Right. It's uh, gay marriage. It's, right. it's that same abortion. It's that yeah. same set of questions. Right. And, and so what I'm, what I'm concerned about yeah. Because, I, I mean, as a, as a non-Catholic, right. uh, is, is this, this wouldn't be uh, a kind of a, the first of a, of a series of... Uh, well, in, in October, they're going to have a synod, okay? In, uh, they're bringing the cardinals in from around the world, into Rome. They're going to talk about family issues, divorced and remarried Catholics. Now, what do they want to do about that? There have been some a tendency on the part of ch certain church authorities in the past to speak with derision. As this pope said, what are you going to do, excommunicate people? No, we have to have a more pastoral approach. As far as celibacy is concerned, 
Look, I don't know. Maybe they'll make it optional. Maybe they'll allow the bishops to decide. We already have married priests. People forget that. Those uh, bishops who came over from the Eastern Rite churches, the Anglicans, for example, themselves, they come over there with their families. So I don't know if they'll do it or not. But by the way, I don't think this is going to resolve all the problems some people seem to think they are. If that were the case, then the mainline Protestant denominations should be doing very, very well. They have married priests. Most of them are pro-abortion for that matter. They, they, they accept all the progressive ideas. And their numbers are going south, and our numbers are not. So um, yeah, who knows where it'll go with this? But, but sure, you, there could be a change. But if you change, if this does get changed, then you know that the questions that you refer to, uh, as you call them, sex obsessed, as right. I as I clarified what the four usual right. main questions are, you know they're going to double down, triple down, and they're going to get back the the so-called right. you know uh, 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 the women who want the exactly. priests and the priests, right, uh, right, the right. women in the priesthood, and everything right. else, and lighten up on on gay marriage and right. accept gay marriage. Right. So, right. I mean, but right. do you think there's any? I won't say danger, but in my own mind, danger that uh, if one falls and the others? Well, there's no question that if he were to say that celibacy is optional, that the bishops around the world can make up their own decision about that, that, that there would be a movement on the part of these people who I don't really believe are sincere Catholics, quite frankly, because they never talk about anything but sex. They don't talk about what real Catholics think about in terms of the mass, for example. They're obsessed with these issues. So, you know, let them go. They ought to just leave the Catholic Church and, and become a Presbyterian or a Methodist or an Episcopalian because they really accept those ideas. I don't know why they're, they're parked and, and, and put themselves in a home where they're homeless, basically, at this point. So, yeah, there's a danger that the, that the pressure will be on. The media love to manipulate public appreci uh, uh, appreciation and, and opinion and say, listen, this is the way the church is going and whatnot. No, I, For, to what end? You know, the only the only woman I would like to see main, main uh, priest are those nuns who don't want to be a priest, the sisters of life, and the others who take their vows seriously. Some of those nuns who who are mistaken their vocation for that of social work, and who the only thing in life they want is to become a priest, they're the ones exactly because they're interested in power. They're not interested in something sacramental. All right, let's talk about the uh, the trip. Um, um, your overview of of uh, what the Pope accomplished and how he conducted himself. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's, he's getting criticism from all sides, and I understand that. It's a very delicate walk, isn't it? You're walking into places where some people are looking at every single thing he does as if he's giving a signal to this. I think he's trying to bring about peace. I mean, that's a, about it. Now, did he do the right things, the wrong things? I don't know. People are making, did he, was he right to correct or not correct? Or who's well, got I, the better I want to get, I get to that. Yeah, well, 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 I, I do want to get to I that. I think it's a bit overdrawn, well, quite frankly. Let, let's, let's play, uh, we have the soundbite of... Um, of, uh, of Netanyahu uh, talking to a translator right. who translates to, to the Pope, and the Pope then tr says something back, and they're talking about um, uh, what language. Actually, I think Netanyahu said the Pope uh, that Jesus spoke Hebrew, right. and uh, and then the uh, the Pope shot back uh, Aramaic. Right. And so let's let's I don't know how much we could hear from this, but this is what's going on in this video. Let's give a listen and a watch. <laughs> Paulus, er all right, so the Pope, the Pope corrected him, and then uh, and then uh, Netanyahu acquiesced and said, "Okay, he spoke both." And you know, I, I'm re I'm reading here from a um, Israeli linguistics professor told Reuters that uh, both Netanyahu uh, and the Pope uh, had a point. Jesus was a native uh, Aramaic speaker, um, uh, but he would have also known Hebrew because there was a, a, the extent uh, because there were uh, religious writings in Hebrew. Uh, so, I mean, I'm no historian, and, and I don't know, but. But again, you know, should the Pope have made a point of, of, at that point, with the Prime Minister of Israel interjecting that? You know, all I can tell you is that he's known for his spontaneity. Uh, and that gets him into some trouble. Like, like being so spontaneous on the plane coming back from Brazil, and now the, the, the plane coming back from the Middle East. And that's when you open the door to these kinds of misinterpretations. Uh, I think this is much ado about nothing. It's inconsequential. I don't think most Catholics would, wouldn't even know whether, whether Jesus spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. And you know what? It's not going to change their, their feelings one way or another. Now, the Pope is, a, like I say, he, he's, he's very much an impromptu guy. He doesn't go by script. And there's a plus to that, but there's also a minus. Right. Now, um, the, um, the Pope 
very touching. Uh, he uh, he placed uh, an envelope in the cracks of the of the, uh, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, uh, the holiest spot in uh, in Judaism. Um, and he also uh, went to uh, the uh, Holocaust uh, uh, Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial, and he said, uh, "Never again, Lord, never again. Here we are, Lord, shamed by what man." created in your own image and likeness was capable of doing. He repeated that phrase in writing when he signed the guest book. Very touching and, and you know, and a, a very moving moment, no doubt about that. Um, he also, uh, though, you know, went to the wall that separates, uh, you know, the Israel and, and the so-called West Bank and protects Israel from terrorists and put his hand on that and prayed there and then, you know, had somewhat, some viewed as kind of harsh, crit critical comments of, of, of Israel and, and you know pro-Palestinian type comments. Um, again, it's a very fine line to walk. If you put yourself in the middle of that, you're going to get criticized no matter what you do. But it's almost uh, equating not the Western Wall with that wall, but it's almost you know ignoring the terrorism factor, ignoring the the the, the, the fact that Palestinians teach their kids to kill the Jew and Jews are monkeys. You know, I mean, it, it's it's yeah. overlooking a lot. I happen to agree with you, and I happen to agree with those critics of the Pope on this. Uh, in fact, there was a Muslim who made an anti-Jewish remark uh, in front of him, and he should have corrected him. Uh, so I think there were some, some, some moments there that were lost. I do think that when he put the wreath there with, with Theodore Herzl, yes. the, the founder of Zionism, Zionism, that's really also a statement against Pius X, who didn't recognize the coming of Israel again. So I think that was an important statement to it well. But I think, uh, uh, no, I think there was an, a couple of moments there. Uh, I don't like moral equivalency. We know that in the Middle East, the people being murdered have been Jews and Christians, and the people who've been murdering them have been Muslims. In the name of radical Muslim, I'll give you that. But uh, any kind of equivocation is not going to sit well with Bill Donahue, I'll tell you that. Yeah, that, that's what, one of the things I love about you. Yeah. You always speak your mind. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the I, I think the summit invitation, uh, I think you know, sure. it's not going to accomplish anything, but symbolically, I think that's sure. a very nice thing. Right. And I think we'll be interested to see what the uh, so-called Palestinians will say to, in regard to that. So, uh, yeah, I think, look, he's, he's in a tough spot, obviously, but uh, I think I think it came across pretty well for the, for the most part. All right, well, the one and only uh, Bill Donahue. Uh, and and, and um, the, the um, I, I, was, I was glad that it, it, it went as well as it did. I'm glad that everything took place. And uh, the first person I thought of, to be honest with you, when I saw these things occurring and heard these things was you. And I wondered what you would say. And we haven't talked about this before right, right, now, right, and, right, uh, right. and I'm glad you came on. And you're always, th this is what I love about the Catholic League. This is what I love about this man. No matter what the issue, not that, he crit not that he's willing to criticize the Pope, but he's willing to say whatever is in his heart, whatever is in his mind. And, and that's why I love you, and that's why I'm, I've been a friend of yours and vice versa well, for so many years, and I admire you so much. And your honesty has always been refreshing to me, Steve. Well, I appreciate that. Hey. Always Thank good you. to see you. Bill Donahue, you, ladies Thank and gentlemen. Uh, when we come back, um, we have the panel, and we have a lot to talk about. We have the uh, speech given at West Point today by uh, President Obama. Uh, we have the um, speech that he gave in Afghanistan where he talked about uh, getting out. We have the fact that they outed in Afghanistan the bureau chief of Kabul, the CIA bureau chief, accidentally, and now there's an investigation into it. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, with our uh, expert uh, panel, and uh, I can't, I can't, only thing is, I can't tell you who it is, because if I told you who was on the panel, um, all right, I, can I tell him who's on the panel? Let me, let me tell him who's on the panel. It's going to be um, uh, Paul Vallely, the one and only uh, Paul Vallely, retired uh, Major General Paul Vallely, and uh, also a uh, columnist for Breitbart and American Thinker, C. Edmund Wright. So don't miss it. We're coming back with the one and only Malsberg panel right here on the Steve Malsberg Show. <laughs>